Gregor Rozumovsky is a descendant of the last hetman Kirill Rozumovsky that was leading Zaporizhia troops. Also, he is an Austrian historian, political, social and culture figure Earl. The man was born on March 3, 1965 in the city of Gissen. His first visit to Ukraine was in 1991. Gregor is a specialist in countering propaganda and disinformation, one of the leading analysts in the field of communication and information flows in the German-speaking country of the European Union. The man worked on international political information campaigns. Gregor is the initiator of the Internet project against Russian propaganda Reality Bites. After the start of full-scale war, Gregor Rozumovsky became the founder, co-author and host of the YouTube project Power of Reason to Fight Russian Fakes. Today we are on the island of Hortica. Earl, historian, analyst Gregor Rozumovsky is next to me. The man's roots go back to Kirill Rozumovsky. This means that Earl Gregor is a direct descendant. I'm glad to see you in Zaporizhia, in Hortica. So, Gregor, uh, what, do, what does it mean for you when you know that you have a roots of Ukrainian? I don't just have roots in Ukraine. I am Ukrainian. Uh, and. Um, For me, coming here has a special meaning, that yes. Yeah. Because my, my ancestor was one of, the, one of the last leaders of the Zaporozhian host. Yeah. Uh, he was after that succeeded by, uh, well, the last one. <laughs> And um, this is closely connected to our family history because actually it is one of the great failures of my ancestor Kirill, because he was trying to get the Hetman and the Zaporozhian host united and create a new political sphere. Yeah? And he didn't manage to. So that was the moment in 1764 when Catherine the Great forced him to abdicate. Yeah? And <laughs> 12 years later, you've got this, this uh, mass murderer Pachomkin coming over here and killing everybody and everything he could. Yeah. So it's a double, it's a double fe feeling. Yeah? It's a bit of a, it's a bit sad. It's a bit, uh, it's ambivalent. Yeah? You are from Austria, but you visit Ukraine a uh, whole our independence because I know that you begin to visit from the 1991st and the years and years and again you are here. So is it important for you? Yes. Uh, I cannot really tell you why, yes. But when I come here, when I come to this, our country, uh, it gives me a great deal of warmth and of I don't know, happiness. And uh, even now, even, even during the war, yeah? I mean, since February 22, it's the sixth time I've been coming here. So, uh, more than ever before. <laughs> you correct me on the beginning of our conversation that you feel you uh, yourself like Ukrainians, but you're from Austria and you're feeling like Ukrainians. Why is it important for you? It, for me, it's a bit easier yeah, because I've been living in, in sev seven or But six or seven different countries since I was born. And so it's, it's not so difficult to re-identify re with Ukraine. Perhaps it's that. Yeah. Now we have like a hard time here yeah, for Ukrainian, for Ukrainians, because unfortunately we have a war. Uh, is it not uh, uh, scary for you and difficult for you to visit our country and visit Zaporizhia because we are so close to the uh, front line? Uh, during the war. You don't look, look scared. <laughs> so why should I be? Yeah. Um, no, I'm, the only thing that makes it a bit difficult is, is the 25 hours of train. <laughs> I know that you're also a historian, uh, you're also an analyst, yeah, and you, uh, during all your life, uh, learn uh, the history of Ukraine, of Europe. Um, can you see this uh, maybe before the war, yeah, maybe before 2014? Can you see maybe the circumstances and before this war and uh, how to say, like, background for this war? Well, the one thing is this whole question about Russian identity and so on, which is not Russian, it's just Moscovite. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the necessity for Putin to claim all parts of the whole Rus for himself, yeah? just to justify 
his his role. But um, to, to my point of view, this is not um, not really sufficient enough explanation for for this murderous energy. Mm. I think this is going to be remembered in history as the most stupid and most unnecessary war in Europe since the year zero. Yeah? It's completely pointless. Um, the Muscovites have no advantage from gaining more territory. This is nonsense. Uh, not in the modern world. <laughs> no, it's... Um, and I have to admit, in January 22, yes, I was holding a, a speech on the future of Ukraine in Vienna. Yeah? And I was saying the idea that Russia should be should go and attack Ukraine in this situation is just ridiculous. It's just completely absurd because it would be so incredibly stupid. And then they did it. And then everybody told me, well, they did. They said, well, yes, it's stupid. It's still stupid. It doesn't change anything about that fact. Yeah. How do you think, for example, maybe before uh, 2022, yes, uh, maybe also before 2014, Ukrainian or Ukrainian politics can predict this war. Because uh, before 1991, we was a part of uh, Soviet Union. I think that the, that the West is to blame for a lot of this. Uh, when Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum and the whole Security Council of the Europe United Nations signed the Budapest Memorandum in 94, uh, this should have been a sufficient guarantee of security. Uh, and all those Western powers like the United States, Great Britain, France, simply treason basically but they did yeah they left ukraine completely in the in the lurch left ukraine completely sitting on a little island and turning them bye-bye yeah and that was that was probably the first real crime um, and that gave putin the idea that he could do whatever he wants to yeah this, that's the thing with dictators if you don't come and push against them they will start they will continue taking yeah and um so I see, I really see a lot of fault there with, with Western powers. Yeah. How do you think maybe Europe was ready for this situation? Not at all. <laughs> the same thing again. They were thinking this is too stupid. It could not possibly happen. Yes. This would be a complete waste of, of, of um, material and human beings, basically, and so on. So it couldn't possibly happen. Yeah. What the Europeans simply overestimated, I think, was the intellect of Putin. Mm -hmm. yeah. They thought this is some kind of a great leader who does things by really thinking them through and so on. It's not. Yeah. These are not the actions of a great leader, it's just a lot of a great statesman. Mm -hmm. He's like a little boy who's been, who's, who's annoyed because somebody is taking away his toys. Yeah. And then goes on a cr incredibly murderous spree. Yeah. So, um, the Europeans were completely unprepared. <laughs> Actually, they even sold enormous amounts of weapons. Mm -hmm. The Germans got rid of 2,200 tanks. They reduced them to 190 with <laughs> within the last 30 years. This is incredibly stupid as well. Yes. Yes. Um, but Europeans have forgotten that if you have democracy, you want to keep democracy, you have to be able to defend it. Because democracy is not given by God, it's something to have worked, to have work for and work for and work for. And this is... Now Ukraine is setting an example. Yeah? It's Ukraine that's showing the West, mm -hmm. actually you defend your democracy. You, not just your country, it's, it's about the whole system. It's about credibility before your children and grandchildren. It's something far more important, really. Yeah? A nation that is free is the only kind of nation that can live in peace. And you cannot have peace without freedom. It's not peace if you're not free. Yeah. Now we have a lot of horrible news in Ukrainian media, also in abroad. But for example, how do you think, is it enough support from Euro European country now for Ukraine? But definitely not. 
definitely not. And this is, again, this is really hard to understand, or it is even too easy to understand, because one explanation would be that the Europeans and the Americans are just waiting for Russia to expand, um, expend, spend too much of their um, material, lose sufficient men to be weak, yeah, and do it at the cost of Ukrainians. Yeah. Letting Ukrainians wage the war of the West. And this is what is happening, I think. I'm not sure it is done really consciously or by intent, but this is what is happening. The sacrificing Ukrainians and uh, delivering some weapons when they have much more. And they do have more than that. Yeah? The United States has not gotten rid of their weapons. The United States has more weapons than anybody else on this planet, uh, basically more than the next, next 25 nations combined. <laughs> it's completely crazy. Yeah. They could easily deliver so much that it would be possible to push back the Muscovites to Moscow. A huge part of war now is also propaganda, yes, and not so much people, if be honest, for example, in Europe or in the United States, know the real picture about Ukraine, about, for example, situation uh, in Ukraine, about war, about other situation, yes. But what do you think about propaganda, Russian propaganda? I mean, is it really very powerful? It's one of the most powerful tools they have at the moment. Uh, you've got uh, social media, starting with TikTok, which is really filled, as idiotic as it sounds, but TikTok is filled with pro-Russian propaganda. You've got Instagram, you've got Facebook and YouTube, and everywhere you find Russian propaganda in the sense of somebody um, making uh, remarks like, well, this is not really our war, and why should we be interested, and we are, we are living here in the West, why should we why should be spending money, and so on. Um, that's one of the typical things. Uh, and then you've got the direct influencing the political parties. Starting with uh, the Brexit, we had uh, Mr. Nigel Farage, who's been directly influencing the people, and there's been very, very strong, um, well, at least, well, you could even call it proof, yes, that he's been, be he's been given money by Russia. Then you've got the Freedom Party in Austria, which has been very strongly connected to uh, the party of Mr. Putin. Um, you've got, again, the um, Alliance for Deutschland, which again is also being massively supported, or Marine Le Pen of the Rassemblement National, uh, which is the nationalist French group, also massively supported by Russia. All the right-wing fringe groups, yeah? mm -hmm. right, right wing. Basically, some of them are really just Nazis, and they're being supported by Russia. At the same time, you have Russia saying, or rather Moscow, saying that the Nazis are in Ukraine. Now, this is completely crazy, the situation. Yeah. For example, because I think it's like a two part of this propaganda, like for Ukrainians and yes. for Europe and United States, for example, yes. And uh, for example, how can uh, the um, European uh, can change uh, the uh, part of propaganda for them? Because it's like uh, the other kind of news for them, for example. Well, they could simply start doing proper information work, which for some reason happens nowhere. Uh, and I'm, I'm not speaking about um, Uh, debunking or, or showing what is fake. It's not even necessary. It would be just be good to show what are the facts. Yeah? And this is not happening. And then there are stories. So if somebody is debunking something, disinformation, propaganda, Russian one, um, it's usually private organizations. Yeah? Which, and private organizations don't have that much money. So it's a question of funding. Yeah? So... For instance, one typical thing that goes around Europe all the time, always in circles, about um, uh, Mrs. Zelensky yeah? going somewhere to New York and going to, to a Cartier shop and then behaving very badly. This whole story is completely baseless. This, this story has been repeated about her being in, in Paris, about her being in Berlin, and so on. Yeah? It's always the same thing. Or a story about somebody, um, again, uh, Mrs. Zelensky buying some 
beautiful big villa yeah, somewhere. And it's always the same numbers, 2.8 million or 20.8 million. Uh, again and again and again and again. And so there's always somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who has actually seen it and who knows Mrs. Zelensky. Which is, um, this is the kind of propaganda that is really nasty. Because this appeals to the really bad parts of the character of human being, which is greed and envy. Everybody else thinks, yes, I would also like to go to Cartier, or I would also like to buy a house on the Riviera. Yeah? Yeah? So this is really people who then feel the base, the base things. Yeah? Um, one thing that should be definitely be uh, there should be more information about is really how much the fight that is going on is going on and also about Russian war, war crimes. There's not enough definitely about that. Yeah? And that is something that the Ukrainian government should perhaps be... Uh, I don't know, they must have their reasons, but um, that's something I would suggest. Just spread this information a little bit more. Can you, for example, separate the uh, kind of propagandas for European and for also for Ukrainians? Because uh, in Ukraine, unfortunately, we have um, a uh, not, not a couple, a lot of people who believe in the Russian propaganda also. Yes, I've, I've read quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's a bit repetitive. Uh, and it's also about, always about members of the cabinet who are being incredibly corrupt. Money, again, money, money, money. It's always the same thing about money, obviously. Um, Sometimes I think it would be not so bad if somebody sat down in front of the camera and um, simply explained what happens where, how how money is actually being distributed, how funding is happening, uh, budgeting, and so on. Um, obviously, there are cases of corruption, but that's everywhere. Yep. <laughs> yeah, go to Austria; you would be really surprised. <laughs> um, so. Just explain a little bit. Also explain about, just tell people, well, this is the rumor, yes? This is the story that's going on. Uh, it has been produced in Moscow. And now please let us tell you the truth. Yeah. Perhaps there should be a bit more than that. A bit more of that. Yeah. You tell about the TikTok, Instagram, really, these are very popular, especially for young adults. Yes, and definitely. how can we change the situation, maybe? Or we uh, don't need to change, maybe? No, we need to change. Yeah, that's really a problem. But there, again, there's a, quite a bit of... Uh, well, the trolling. If something comes on Facebook or on any of these media that is against Russia, there will be immediately tons and tons and tons of, of, of mails and of messages to Facebook. And then they will scrap that bit. Yes. And then they will perhaps check it up and so on. Eventually, a week later, they will give it free again. Um, this doesn't happen the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Russian propaganda sits on the internet. And just sits there. Yeah? And if I sit at home and I start writing, <laughs> this is propaganda, my one message will not change much. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that might be also be something to do. Mm? I know that you have a YouTube channel uh, called like Power of Skin. Yeah. What the main goal of this uh, YouTube channel? What do you want to say and to show people and this channel for uh, young adults or for old adults? I'm trying to just to show again where some things in the more uh, in the history of the Soviet Union and of this whole long Muscovite empire. Um, where things simply went wrong or where things have been interpreted in a very creative way. Yeah? Um, I still have a, a few more um, sequences that I'm working on. It's, I'm trying to give the Western audience, it's in English, um, simply another impression of what is going on in the, in the East or what has gone on. Yeah? It's about, for instance, simple things like um, like Russia being 
part of the Rus. I mean, it was part of the of the Kievan Rus for 40 years. That's not a lot. And the reconnection was 1654, which is again there was a big, big space in between. Yeah, 1169 they, they, they left basically. 1654. Somehow, can't even say they came back to try to subjugate the Hetmanate. So um, that will be the historical bit. And then also simply about one topic that is interesting to me is how Russia had the same chance as Ukraine in 1991 to become a democracy. Now, why did Moscow develop into this, what it is today? Why is Ukraine? Ukraine as it is, a democratic country with people who are patriotic and um, are positive. And, uh, uh, why? Yeah. Why does the one country fall into dictatorship again? Why does Ukraine not? Yeah. That's the topic. Mm -hmm. From, that's one of the topics at the moment that's interesting <laughs> to me. Yeah. Nine million euros were spent from the EU budget on resisting disinformation between 2018 and 2020. For comparison, the budgetary financing of all Kremlin media reached three billion dollars during the same period. What well, the main audience of your YouTube channel is it like uh, adults in Europe or like ad young adults? Young or... adults and adults, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, YouTube is being used in, in Europe by people up to sixty uh, routinely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, other social media such as Facebook, which the Russians have been using extensively, uh, are not being used anymore by the young people. So there again you can see why it's not very professional. Yeah. We can hear now and like maybe a year ago also in Ukraine and also in Europe that the countries and our country also like people a little tired of war because it's like a huge period. Yeah, it is hard. Is it really? situation when the people tired about news, about horrible things? In, in Western Europe, this is also a bit of a propaganda war. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that goes, you can hear it from the right-wing parties, yeah? the extreme right-wing parties. Uh, this whole thing about being tired of the war and it's costing it so much and so on, is part of their propaganda. Now, actually, that is to the advantage of Ukraine, because Whenever one of these right-wing parties comes up with some radical idea like that, all the other parties are more or less obliged to say no. Yeah? And this is also what is happening. So um, I wouldn't overestimate the importance of that. Yeah. You can see it very well in Germany. Yeah. It, uh, the conservative Christian Democratic Party is, I think, believed mostly as a reaction to the right-wing party. Um, saying, no, no, we have to go on supporting Ukraine. Yeah. So that's not so. Um, I wouldn't take that too seriously, this bit. Yeah. Russian propaganda creates and spreads fakes in order to sow doubts among Europeans, undermine trust in the local institutions, increase the tension in society and create discord between different social groups. Now we can also hear from people, yeah, that uh, like we have um, a couple of front, like uh, front line where the soldiers, yeah, fight with Russian soldiers, mm -hmm. and uh, front line in social media. We talk yes. with you about this situation, about propaganda, also like economist uh, front line, for politicals front line. But for example, how do you think uh, all of these are important now, or we can separate or divide this? No, they're different parts of one the same. Um process. Yeah? Um, a German philosopher on war that exists, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, said once, um, war is the continuation of politics by merging other means, meaning it's politics, it's always politics, the whole thing is politics. And uh, then all these other things are just part of it. Yeah? Economy can be a weapon exactly like a rocket can. Yeah? And this is what it is about. Uh, you can also see that on the other, uh, the other way around. Uh, if you look at uh, Mr. Putin 
claiming again and again and again that the sanctions don't hurt Russia and that Europe should really just forget about the sanctions and do away with the sanctions. Well, if there was a better proof that the sanctions work, uh, I still would like to see it. It is obvious from his reactions that it works. So that's the one thing that West is doing that's actually a support. Yeah. Probably, but also, again, it's a part of war. Yeah. But for example, uh, for you, like historian, and uh, for example, we know before uh, 2014, uh, a lot of Ukrainians said like Russia, elder brother for Ukrainian, yes. for example. But now we see the different situation, horrible situation with this. How do you think about this? Uh, because like uh, we were, we was uh, a part of Soviet Union, but whole, whole our history, uh, we uh, fight with uh, Russian Imperia and uh, yes. Soviet Union and now with Russia. I think that the, this element of elder brother and son, it was a lot of, because of the common experience of the Soviet Union in those general. I mean, after the 30s, there were another 60 years before Ukraine became free. And in those years, there was a common um, suffering, a common experience of the Soviet dictatorship. But you can also turn this around and say, well, if the Russians had the same experience as the Ukrainians of those years, why do they attack Ukraine? Actually, it's even worse that way. Because if the Russians think that the Ukrainians are their little brothers, why, why again, why are they waging war against them? Why not coming as friends, or yeah, which they have not done for quite a while? <laughs> I know that you begin to learn the history of Ukraine before uh, our independence year, before 1991. And uh, I know that you were with Ukraine during whole independence, beginning from the 1991. Uh, did you see and do you see now the changes inside the Ukraine, except the war, of course? Actually, one could see very, very early on, very early 90s, how this Ukrainian character is coming through. Yeah? You have the old generation that's been uh, brainwashed or uh, blindfolded by, by Soviet education and propaganda. Yeah? But you could see very, very early on um, how the younger people are already immediately expanding the horizon. And so I would say that by the end of the 90s, Ukraine was again Ukrainian. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Come back to the former times those times. <laughs> <laughs> if you talk about the parties, uh, we know the history and there are a lot of different parties in Ukraine and uh, which all time had a good conversation uh, relationship with Russia and if be honest now these parties also continue to some of them in politics uh, have a good relationship with Russia. What do you think about this? Uh, do we need to change the situation and do we need to change the parties and uh, do we have a chance for this? Yes, that's a huge, huge, huge problem. Um, the thing is in a, let's call it a more traditional democratic society, a political party comes into being around the program, not around the person. You have a program, you've got social um, um, reforms, you've got perhaps health reforms, you've got defense, economy, industry, agriculture. That's a program. You tell your vo the voter what you want specifically each of these points, and you tell them what's why, yeah? And then you vote for somebody who represents this and who really will do his best to stick to this program. In Ukraine, you have a face, it's called Yulia, or it's called <laughs> Petro, and that's then the party, yes? Yep. And that's not a party. That's not a political party. That's just, I don't know, a bit like in, in old Rome, uh, ancient Rome. And this, this is not good at all. Yeah? So that's the one thing we really need here, yeah? political parties with real programs. Mm -hmm. And people need to sit down and start to develop that. Yeah? There's a reason why there are these specific parties in the West. Yeah? They all fulfill a certain function, <laughs> yeah? even if they don't know that, but they do. <laughs> yeah? And um, that's for the voter then to decide. You say, well, this year I'm going to vote for that one, or in four years, I'll vote for the other one. Yeah. I vote for that one who provides the more 
convincing program. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that is really something that needs to be done soon, fast, efficiently and in a lasting way. Yeah. A little bit about you, because uh, we know that uh, your roots from Kirill Rozumovsky and we know that uh, Russian, Russian Imperia and Russian propaganda changed this history, because if you will ask the Ukrainians, uh, they will, uh, no one of them can answer correctly about the history about Kirill Rozumovsky. And maybe do you feel like your own, your personality, bad feelings for Russia of this situation, because they change the history? story? Um, I wouldn't say bad feelings because this again this is part of war and the situation in 1764 which led to the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine had met, uh, was pre-war and after that it was an interest of Catherine the great mm -hmm. Catherine the second to um, to stabilize the whole thing yeah? so then she pr actually produced she herself produced uh, quite a few good lies about her family. She also did a few things like, uh, it was very, very clever. When she, she promo promoted uh, Kirillo to field marshal, which meant at the time, which meant that you have a personal guard of honor. Now, just one year before, another person who had a personal guard of honor was murdered, Ivan VI, the last Romanov emperor. No? This is what having a guard of honor meant in that time there. Yeah? And Kirill was sitting in Petersburg and he was strictly forbidden from traveling to Ukraine. Yeah? He was only allowed to travel back to Ukraine after the Zaporozhian siege was destroyed. Yeah? <laughs> so it's, um, that's just one of the simple things. Yeah? Another one is how um, Kirill tried to, to make a push against Catherine. A few, a few months before, a year before, in 1763, 1764, when he tried to liberate this Ivan VI from Schlüsselburg to make a counter Tsar, to have a, have a dual, a word of a civil war, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Catherine obviously understood very well, she's a clever person, that she had either the possibility of killing him, but then she would have to kill his whole family, uh, or to to cover him so much in chocolate and gold yeah, that people would not would, would forget about it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that was a good way of dealing with it. Yeah? He's, he knew he was basically a prisoner, but he was sitting in Petersburg in a very, very gilded cage. Yeah? Um, yeah, and then Ukrainians started to forget about him. In a way, one could even see that he deserved that, because in, he had the moment in 1764 when he could have started a war against Russia, and he did not. <laughs> But we have not only about this yeah, period of history when the Russia tried to change the history for Ukrainians and for Ukraine in general. I mean. No, but there's so many examples. But the, the most basic, simplest one is the one I, I named before, with this, this very small phase uh, in the rule of Andrei Bogolyubsky, uh, who was the prin prince of, in the East. Uh, revolting against Kiev. This is 40 years of common rule. Um, 1654, Treaty of Pereslav. Nobody knows what is written in this treaty or was written in this treaty because this, this specific treaty was destroyed uh, and it was destroyed by Russians. So they must have destroyed it for a reason. Uh, that all copies, collected all copies that was by uh, order of Peter the, the Great. Again, the Great, they seem to have something for the Great. Yeah. Um, and, and again, the reason will probably have been that it was too much to the advantage of Ukraine. Word Us, from which Russian and Russia derive, was taken by Peter I to solidify his claims to Russia being European. 
With its capital situated within the space of modern Kyiv, the Rus was one of the European superstates of the 9th to 13th century. This powerful state expanded from modern Ukraine to wide swaths of Belarus and partially Poland. The Kievan Rus was an integral element of Europe participating in trade and sharing culture and development. The Tsardom of Muscovy, or Moscow, appears in the historical sources only in 1277. In other words, 400 years after the foundation of the Kievan Rus. And this, some 1,000 kilometers to the northeast of Kiev, uh, well outside of the historical boundaries of the Rus. This fact does not prevent Moscow autocrats from trying to appropriate the identity of foreign countries and people. The rulers of the Tsardom of Muscovy falsify the historical narratives up to today. I know that you have a, a big family, yeah, but if I know correctly, only you from your uh, family uh, learn of the history of Ukraine. Yes, it's something I don't really understand. Um, my grandfather spoke Ruthenian, yes, and my grandfather told me a lot about Ukraine, but somehow I'm the only one in, in, in only surviving male in our family uh, who identifies with Ukraine, yes, yeah. which is regrettable. <laughs> yes, I would like some support there, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> You're ahead of your family. Yes, I am, yeah. Do you feel maybe some, like, I don't know, maybe more responsibility for this? Possibly, yes. And that could also be a reason why the other ones don't want that, because then they would have to accept it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, yes, probably, yeah. Mm. I heard uh, before our interview here yeah, that you uh, told a little uh, and a couple of words in Ukrainian. So you can understand Ukrainian, but you uh, don't speak, yes? Uh, I speak a little bit. I read it well, but I've been done that for many, many years. But there's a big difference between reading historical <laughs> texts yes, <laughs> and then using it. Yeah. Mm. But it's a language I like a lot. It's, <laughs> it's a very nice melody and so on. You have a daughter, yes? Yes. Do you uh, teach uh, them uh, about Ukrainian history? Yes, of course. Is that um, you have this tradition which goes, starts somewhere that goes through generation to generation to generation to generation to generation, <laughs> and it just goes down directly and well preserved. Um, but our family had a, had a chance to be able, my line of our family, had a chance to leave the Russian Empire in 1811 already. Yeah, so it's because we did not agree with. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you for our conversation. The pleasure is all mine. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> Thank you for you. the good questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.